And the essential question for today's lecture, right, which is number four out of five, why are there gaps in the fossil record? First item in the left-hand column. So in your left-hand column, right, interpreting the fossil record. When scientists attempt to interpret or explain the history of life, scientists will use a variety of evidence to support these explanations. The fossil record provides a record of the history of life and has been an important part of developing what's called evolutionary theory. However, the fossil record is incomplete, which means it does not provide a complete record of all living things that have ever lived on Earth. There are many reasons why the fossil record is incomplete. Fossils can be formed from either the remains of an organism or the marks, such as footprints or, or burrows, left by that particular organism. When most organisms die, they rot and they leave no trace of their existence. Because of this, fossils are formed very rarely. And most fossils form in environments where deposition is taking place. Sediments, such as mud or some fine volcanic ash, provide the best environment for fossilization. Organisms that die on dry land are less likely to be fossilized than those that die in lakes or shallow seas. This means that environments such as lakes or shallow seas provide or produce lots of of fossils. Organisms that lived or died in these environments are much more common in the fossil record. Think of life on Earth as part of a big tree, a tree of life. Biological organisms, both living and extinct, are placed around the tree according to their relationships with one another. To understand these relationships, scientists combine fossil and genomic evidence to fill in the evolutionary gaps. But when no genetic material is available, scientists must rely entirely on the fossil record. For instance, one of the most common fossils found around the world are from a class of marine arthropods called trilobites. Having gone extinct hundreds of millions of years ago, paleontologists have only their fossils to rely on. Normally, we know a fossil species from one individual or maybe a couple individuals. And although we can get a lot of information, we don't know about what they were like as a population. But with trilobites, we can. Unlike the ancestors of many land animals or soft-bodied creatures, the trilobite fossil record is so good, we have fossils of them dating anywhere from 520 to 250 million years ago. From a common ancestor, trilobites blossomed into nine distinct orders, and for at least 120 million years, trilobites were a sturdy branch in the tree of life, with 10 to 15,000 known species. Trilobites were arthropods, but they're nothing like any crustacean known today, save the horseshoe crab, a primitive creature that coexisted with trilobites as long as 445 million years ago. Arthropods grow by molting their skeleton. So any one individual trilobite could make, potentially, a new fossil every time it grew because it would produce a new shed skeleton. Because trilobites have very durable shells, and because each individual could produce multiple fossils, we know more about them than we know about most types of ancient organisms. Beginning with the Cambrian explosion, roughly 542 million years ago, life took off in the oceans and numerous species of trilobites evolved. Despite a few small extinction events, populations appeared to grow and grow until the beginning of the Devonian period, roughly 416 million years ago. Then, trilobites began to disappear. Fossil records indicate that many other aquatic animals were on the rise at this time. It's possible that some fish or squid may have started to prey on trilobites, which might explain why very few of their fossils from this period have been found. 
Roughly 359 million years ago, a massive number of organisms, including trilobites, disappeared from the world's fossil record. This period is known as the Late Devonian Extinction and was one of the five mass extinction events known in Earth's history. Afterwards, trilobite numbers dwindled until the end of the Permian period and disappeared completely during the Permian mass extinction about 251 million years ago. This event is estimated to have killed off 96% of the Earth's marine species. In addition to the environment, some organisms fossilize more easily than others. Soft tissues rot very, very quickly, so muscle and things like that. Even under ideal conditions, they rot very, very quickly, and so they rarely become fossils. This means that organisms that have only soft body parts rarely form fossils. Hard body parts, on the other hand, fossilize much more easily. Therefore, hard animal parts like shells and bones and even certain parts of a plant, like hard pollen grains, things like that, are overrepresented in the fossil record when compared to soft body organisms like worms or sea anemones. This makes it rather difficult to determine all of the organisms that occupied a particular ancient environment. Fossils are continually being formed, however, but the process is very slow, typically speaking. Therefore, fossils may be very close or mixed together in the fossil record, even though the organisms that formed those fossils may have lived thousands of years apart. In 1972, when two American geologists, Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould, published their brilliant paper on the nature of speciation as found in the fossil record, the study of fossils had already been around for centuries. Early man undoubtedly noticed that certain rocks contained the remains of life, such as these seashells. These ancient remains are called fossils. In 1796, French naturalist Georges Cuvier put together the bones of a large extinct sloth and realized that its body plan was identical to animals living today. He summarized that life on the planet had a long history, one marked by change and extinction of species. And he realized that fossils of both animals and plants found in rocks were a partial record of this ancient life as it changed through time. For an organism to be preserved in the fossil record, a remarkable sequence of events must occur. Living organisms are made up of soft tissue and hard parts. A deer, for example, has hard parts of bones and teeth, and soft parts of skin, muscle, and organs. When a deer dies, almost always the soft parts are decomposed by microorganisms. That leaves the hard parts. If the deer should happen to be covered by mud, and then for millions of years that mud is transformed into rock, we get a fossil like this oreodont, an ancient relative of the modern deer. We can see the skull and the teeth have been preserved as fossils. Fossilization can occur in a number of ways. The most common is when an organism, such as this trilobite, becomes buried and the original material is dissolved away, leaving a mold. The mold is then filled with some type of material and a cast of the original organism is created. This is what happened with this trilobite. Petrification occurs when the original molecules of the organism, in the example of this wood, were replaced by silica molecules. Sometimes the original material of an organism is preserved, as happened with the enamel on the oridon's teeth, or as with some ancient plants, are fossilized in the altered chemical state we call coal. 
Lastly, there are trace fossils. These dinosaur tracks are an example of trace fossils. When Darwin wrote his theory of evolution, it was clear that the plants and animals found in the fossil record were not the same as those existing in the current day geologic epoch. There are no dinosaurs running around on the planet today. Still, he summarized life only arose once on the planet. The fossil record is consistent with the main premise of the theory of evolution that states, all life came from a single common ancestor. Life made its appearance sometime before 3.4 billion years ago. In short, as soon as life was possible, life appeared. Then in the early part of the 20th century, geologic strata were organized into a continuous time sequence. It started with the Precambrian era. The Precambrian was followed by the Paleozoic era when complex life emerged in the sea. By the middle of this era, life appeared on the land and all the kingdoms of life as we know them today were well established and represented in the fossil record. The Paleozoic was followed by the Mesozoic era, the era of the dinosaurs. And when they disappeared 65 million years ago, a new era began called the Cenozoic, the age of mammals. By the late 20th century, the main question remaining for biologists and geologists was, how did speciation occur? Darwin had suggested a slow, continuous process of one species replacing another. What Eldridge and Gould gathered from the fossil record was that speciation occurred suddenly and that, as with these ammonites, the daughter species does not necessarily replace the mother species. Further, a mother species can produce multiple daughter species. They call this new idea punctuated equilibrium. This observation opened up a great new time in paleontology. It was found that extinction events caused by meteor impacts and runaway greenhouse phenomenon could wipe out up to 90% of existing species in the geologic blink of an eye and that this resetting of the biological condition led to many new species. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was only one well-known repository of fossils, the Burgess Shale, that preserved soft tissue. It was a window into animals such as modern-day worms that are almost never preserved in the fossil record. By the 21st century, there were over 10 of these fabulous sites. As a result of these types of discoveries, paleontology and geology are entering a new golden age, particularly as natural resources from the planet, such as oil and minerals, become scarce. Our first definition for the lecture, unconformity. A gap in the rock record is called an unconformity. An unconformity is typically the result of rock being erased by erosion or an igneous intrusion, which is a type of rock formation, and or the metamorphosis of that rock. Or if there is simply a period where deposition is not occurring. An unconformity prevents geologists, right, a type of scientist that studies rocks and ancient things, from getting information about a particular time or event in that rock sequence. Next definition, I believe this will be our, our last one, subduction. Subduction is a process in which an ocean tectonic plate, a tectonic plate from the bottom of the ocean, oceanic plate, sinks beneath another plate because that other plate is less dense.
within the oceanic plate. And this is going to occur at what's called a convergent plate boundary. Convergent, where they're coming together, they're smashing together. Now, continental crust, right, the crust that the continents sit on top of, is less dense than oceanic crust. So, oceanic crust will always subduct underneath a continental plate when they converge. If two oceanic plates converge and meet, the denser of the two, right, whichever one is denser, will subduct underneath the other plate. This type of convergent boundary is known as a subduction zone. In addition to fossils being continually formed, created, they're also being continually destroyed. For example, as sedimentary rock that has fossils in it becomes eroded, right? So fossils inside the sedimentary rock, the sedimentary rock is eroded. The fossil record is also lost with that rock. Oftentimes, paleontologists will encounter these types of gaps in the fossil record where rocks containing fossils were eroded and the newer rocks were deposited on top of them. This type of unconformity, which again is a gap in the geological record, this type of unconformity can create the false impression that life has evolved very fast over a short period of time. In addition to erosion, many fossils are destroyed by the moving plates of Earth's crust, right? Tectonic plates, especially during the process of subduction. When a plate that contains fossils in the rock is subducted underneath another or beneath another plate, the parts of that crust that contain fossils are pushed deep into Earth's interior where they will melt thereby destroying the fossil record. Now, fossils are formed in rock, and most rock is hidden from human view. Only in those cases where rock is exposed naturally or through human activities like mining are fossils likely to be found. As more mining and exploration takes place, new fossils are found. Many of the fossils found in museums were found as a result of quarrying. For example, Archaeopteryx, on the screen here, considered to be the ancestor uh, to modern birds, was found in a stone quarry in Germany. Now, despite all these problems with the fossil record, paleontologists have uncovered huge numbers of fossils and have been able to assemble them into a detailed representation of the history of life on Earth. This fossil bed in Canada, the Burgess Shale, is an incredible find. A little over 500 million years ago, a massive mudslide buried an abundance of creatures, beautifully preserving their anatomical features in intricate detail. Such fossil beds are very rare and provide some of the only specimens scientists have to work with to develop a picture of early life on Earth. Few contain fossils as well preserved as those from the Burgess Shale. One reason for this is it's hard to become a fossil, and even harder for that fossil to be discovered. This is particularly true for soft or partially soft-bodied creatures, like worms and jellyfish. In most cases, the only creatures that become fossilized have either a durable hard shell or skeleton. Fossilization is so rare that whole species of animals and plants may evolve and become extinct without one of them being fossilized. Even with a hard shell, there is no guarantee that a dead organism will become a fossil. Scavengers may consume the remains or water waves and currents may destroy them. Even the geochemical nature of water trapped in surrounding sediment can dissolve remains, including hard shells. To become a fossil, an organism needs to die and be covered quickly. This type of burial doesn't often happen on land. As a result, the terrestrial fossil record isn't nearly as comprehensive as the marine record. The Earth's crust is constantly in flux. Some fossils are driven further into the crust in a process called subduction, which happens when tectonic plates collide and one is forced beneath the other. For the fossils that aren't subjected to this process, debris and eroded materials accumulate on top of them over time, making them visible only when rocks are exposed in cliffs and mines. 
Eroded cliffs are usually some of the best places to find fossils. On the other hand, erosion can also destroy fossils. In most parts of the world, the fossil record is incomplete because many layers of the Earth's crust have been eroded away, destroyed, or recycled at some point during geological time. As a result, information about the structure and diversity of the fossil record is lost. Fortunately for us, new tools are helping us decipher the clues the record did leave behind. Wider geographical searches and more sophisticated technologies such as satellites are connecting the dots between what we know and predicting where we might find fossils. In this way, scientists are able to better understand the history of life on Earth. That'll do it for today's lecture. At this point, you should be able to write an answer to today's essential question. Why are there gaps in the fossil record? So at this point, please write down your answer to today's essential question in the summary box at the bottom of your notes.